the leader. I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of turning away from the things that I want to believe in. The savior. Everything seems so far away. Like I'm watching myself, but I'm not really experiencing it. The redeemer. It's time to unite the 12 models once and for all. The righteous. Faith in our right to survive as a species, as a people. That's not a given. That's a choice. All will be revealed. Battlestar Galactica. All new every Friday at 10, part of the all new Sci-Fi Friday. There were 10 cops. Shane, you just have to cop to the fact that you made a stupid bet and you lost. You were- There were not 10 cops. You okay. have to count every nerd no, wearing you said a... there had to be more than 10. There weren't I even counted seven. 10. And that's if, that's if you count all the people in suits who might have been every cosplaying. Every nerd person. in a suit was cosplaying Shane, as a member of Shinra. Because they don't the wear Metreon, suits, they're nerds. The Metreon is three blocks from the financial district. Everyone wears also, suits. Also, there were other cosplayers there. I talked to them, they just didn't have all the stuff for their uh, suits, you yeah, know? Yeah, like, okay. Imaginary yeah. cosplayers. So there were cosplayers in there spirit. Were, there were 10 cosplayers. There so probably you won in spirit. I won. But in fact, I won. You and I are not going to agree. We're going to have to get an arbiter to come in and okay, like Okay, who's going to arbitrate this? Okay, so they're like, going to go Anthony, back in Anthony, time? Anthony was there. Dude, you were there at the Final Fantasy thing. I was right. There were 10 cosplayers. Just tell T-Frog that I was right. I can't talk right now. I'm playing company here is with Sean and Rory against Relic right now. Dude, you're fucking dirt mining game. Who cares? A boring game. We were talking about Final Fantasy. Who cares? We, we, I was right, right? E sure. No, come on. Put That's some heart into it. Whatever Jeremy says. See, Anthony totally knows what's up. Dude, you no, know, we gotta find someone who we gotta find someone who's really there. That one chick, she looks a lot like Steiner. I think she counts. Let's go. Oh, what? Let's go ask him. Where did it come from? Well, we're making Hellgate London, all right? And we're starting from scratch with everything on the game, from the graphics engine to the network infrastructure, the tools, everything is from the ground up. And we think, you know, this is gonna be kind of scary to just turn on Hellgate for thousands and thousands of people around the world and be dry running all this new technology. So we thought, a great idea is to make a little game, send it out for free, that kind of works the same way, uses the same technology, has the same structure, but it's super simple and super easy. So we, th uh, we decided that, yeah, this is probably worthwhile doing. And we had a perfect guy in mind, someone who we had interviewed to come down and work for us uh, on Hellgate, but uh, because he just had a baby and uh, got a new house in Seattle and all this, wasn't able to do so, we thought, heck, let's give him a one-man project and, uh, and run with this. And so he loved the idea, and so we decided to do it. And you know, it was a very, very short time after that we realized, yes, this has to actually become a real game. This is just too obvious. It's too, uh, you know, right in the wheelhouse of gaming, and we're all having kind of fun just clicking around with it. So, let's turn this into a real project. It's pretty accessible, then. Anyone can jump in and not be confused, and it's, it's immediately familiar to anyone who's played not only Diablo series, Diablo two, on PC, but any game in this enormous legacy. It's basically about going through this world, beating shit up, getting cool stuff for it, bragging to your friends, and then they go and try to like, you know, get more cooler stuff than you have. I'll hear the naysayers say, well, it's just Diablo 2, but at the same time, they're totally addicted to it, you know? And it's like, in some ways, it seems like that's enough, you know? Well, who doesn't want more Diablo? I mean, we've all been pining for another Diablo game for so long. And I think the reason that we went with a slightly different aesthetic to it, I mean, Diablo is a little more somber, a little more serious, a little darker, a little more gothic-y. <laughs> But Mythos is really a lot more social game. You know, you're thrust right into towns with all the people, and it isn't just like you get a little party and go off adventuring. It's really a social game, and we're adding a lot of really social features to it. And so we wanted to put a little bit lighter tone so everyone's not super serious as they're walking around town or, you know, all the time. Really in preparation for us adding these uh, social features like guild support and email and games. We're going to have a marketplace coming in soon. 
Um, there's going to be a lot of PvP modes that are competitive and uh, things that we encourage groups to go do. So we really want to push the social aspects of the game. It's, it's hitting on all cylinders for like this new model of PC gaming that's become, you know, come to the forefront over the past year. Well, we're doing a lot of things that are kind of speculative with this project. One thing, we're not working with a, a publisher per se, so uh, you know we can kind of go on our schedule and do what we think is right with it. And one of the things we're doing is experimenting with an entirely new business model for the game. So we are we're going to commercialize it relatively soon this year. Um, and commercialization means only that we're going to turn on money somehow. You know, you're going to be able to download Mythos for free, play it for free, and there's going to be a little item shop in game where you can buy things that will enhance your experience. We're not going to sell the best sword, the best armor, or whatever, and just let you buy the best character, but we're going to do things that assist you in finding and earning the best stuff. Um, and it's a business model that's very popular in Asian games right now. Uh, and in fact, in Asia, the, the market is dominated by these you know, RMT games, real money transactions, where you, you buy little things in game optionally. We're going a little bit more humanitarian with it in that uh, you know, we're not gonna be quite so mercenary in what we're selling so that it actually is viable to play for free. I like this game already much more than I enjoyed Hellgate London, which is flagship's previous game. You know, it's less oppressive, it's just kind of cooler. In the same way that World of Warcraft comes out and it doesn't look as good as Vanguard or as all these other MMOs that came out after it, but it's still like the better game. It's, it's still the game that people want to play. Sure. It kind of just works like, this world's like cool, I can just sit in here and play in it a long time. It's just that they, that they did a really good job with the art. I think everyone, it's a natural reaction. You want to go out and see the sun, you want to see some flowers. And in this game, you, you will have the dark dungeons and caves and things, and you'll also have these really beautiful natural environments where, despite the fact that you're, you're battling these horrible monsters, it's very pretty outside, you know? And I think that that variety there like helps me play for longer periods. That was a tone that was in the very first things we put together for the game. And I think everyone felt like, you know, it was just comfortable to be in. You know, some games you get so tense that after a while you realize that your neck is cricked up and you know you're cramping up and things. But Mythos, it was it was it was something where people were just comfortable hanging out in there and chatting with people, running around, killing some monsters. And you do tend to spend a lot of time. In fact, if you look at our metrics on our server data, you see that people spend you know an average of a, you know two and a half plus hours per session. But the fact is, you can get in and do a mission and get out and get to your dinner reservation, you know, in less time than it takes to get your raid party together in World of Warcraft. Yeah, so it, it does work, you know, for a short burst and for a long, a long session. And I think that the tone, like you were saying, is 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 a big part of that as well. The loot system in it, where everyone sees like their own items, and you're not like trying to who can click the yellow item the fastest. Like, what was the like the that, like your guys' thinking behind creating that sort of system for loot. And that just really came out of a discussion of the things that we found annoying about MMOs and things that people didn't like about them. And one is this, there's, you know, certain classes can kind of push ahead and they're always, there's always seemed to be a mad rush for loot. And uh, one of our programmers, Colin Day, I'll give him a shout out because he deserves it, uh, came up with the idea of just saying, hey, let's make it so that you only see your own loot. And none of us could really figure out why that wouldn't work, so we put it in and it was like instantly, it was just like a relief, you know, it was a weight off your back. You didn't have to be worrying when you're going around with people of rushing ahead, picking up everything, who gets what. It's just relaxed. You see something drop and it's a cool item, it's yours, you can pick it up at your leisure, move your stuff around in your inventory, and it isn't this mad, frantic rush anymore. Basically, it's just the object lost, you know, people love to go through a world and get things that they think are cool and that Absolutely. their friends are going to be envious about. And you have to play it in a social setting like that. If you just do it on your own, there's no one to show off. You know, it's like if you have like the, the mess of the toys on your block and you got no neighbor kids, it's not half as fun as like bringing all of them over to your house and let them see the USS flag, the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier that you got. Yeah. Is it sort of a sign of the times that, you know, Flagship spent so many years, you know, working on, on, uh, on Hellgate and this was kind of like the old paradigm for PC games. You know, this is what a PC game release is going to be like. And then in the past year, it seems like a lot of folks have sort of been going back and reassessing what exactly, I mean, you, you referenced, you know, the Asian market. I mean, a lot of people have had their eyes there. Um, and then it just seems that Mythos is like perfectly, you know, characteristic of how things are going right now. Do you think that? Totally. I think that the box market for a premium AAA game is it's always going to be big, you're always going to have your mega hits there, but it's increasingly difficult for anyone to really compete in that space just because the cost and time uh, investment in it, it makes publishers ginchy about spending that kind of money and so they always want to do the safe things and you never really break new ground with the safe things. And uh, you know, who's going to compete head to head with World of Warcraft? You know, you'd have to spend 150 million dollars and spend six years doing it just to get to where they're at and it just doesn't make sense. So what makes sense is uh, you know, to, to take the expertise that we have and the technologies and the tools that we've developed for these games like Hellgate London and apply them to 
what is kind of traditionally a more casual game space, which is the free to download, free to play games, um, and bring the, the AAA pr uh, production values and stuff into that area where it's been sorely lacking. Um, and, and, and make these games once again fairly accessible to people, you know, and, make, and, make, and give people a variety of titles instead of one every several years. You know, it, it really makes sense for everybody. It makes sense for gamers, it makes sense for publishers, uh, and it makes sense for developers. So we really feel like the, the industry is heavily going towards, you know, uh, towards kind of what we call the AAA casual space. Yeah, I think they'll have a, like, a lot easier time to change like, mechanics behind the game and stuff on a whim. Like on, based on what works and player reaction. Right. One thing I think they've, they've nailed pretty well so far is that the three different classes that you can choose from, the Pyromancer, Gadgeteer, and Bloodletter, all of them, um, Gadgeteer is the one I focused the most on, but I built a couple characters with the other two and jumped up a couple levels, and so far they're pretty fun to play. You're getting like cool like skills pretty much right out the bat, and within two or three levels you've got a few spells, and you can summon a few like zippers to, you know, blow up enemies or whatever, and I feel like that's one thing that they've done really well is made it fun. I mean, it's so hard not to support this game because it's using a proven formula that's very addictive, that's fun to play, it's got a great art direction, it's it's really accessible, and it's free. It's like, how can you not like just tell people, go play it? It's like, that's really all there is to it. Why can't you trust me? You are throwing away a last chance to find us. Hostiles inbound! Let's go! How did they find us? Come on! The five are close. I can feel them. Stop! What the hell is wrong with you? I'm not gonna stop! You gotta kill me! This is not all that we are. Battlestar Galactica. All new every Friday at 10. Part of the all new Sci-Fi Friday. I, I got my grenade, my head yeah. grenade. He's, he's a head. Does that grenade. mean if you disagree with me that I need to run really quickly? Uh, or be near someone you can throw it at really fast. <laughs> well, if it's anything like the bad company grenades are now, you could probably just drop it at my feet and I can. <laughs> no splash damage. <laughs> no right. splash damage, yeah. That's probably something that they're going to fix. Yeah. But I mean, that, that kind of makes me reluctant to say some of the things that I'm going to say because I was really frustrated with my experience a lot of the time. Right. But like, it's a beta, so anything that we're talking about could potentially change. Right. It's not Call of Duty beta, which was a glorified multiplayer demo. This is, seems much more like a real beta. Right. There are a lot of glitches, a lot of bugs. There's no party. You can't invite friends. But still, I think it's fair to say that there are certain things that have been in there every Battlefield game and that are still there. Yeah, it's, it's one of those situations where everything Battlefield does right, it's still there, still fun, vehicular control is still awesome, but many of the things that Battlefield you know, has done wrong or had problems with, I don't know about you, but I was getting spawn capped almost nonstop. Totally, if I was on a losing team, I was, I think my life expectancy was maybe five seconds. Right. And I would try spawning with my squad, maybe somebody got away from the battle, or I would try spawning back at the base, yeah. and trying to get out of the action for at least a few seconds, but it if they've got you locked down, it's just like every other Battlefield game. Once the, once they've got a chopper in the air and a few tanks around their base, there's no escaping. Right, and you know, maybe I've been spoiled from Call of Duty 4, but I really <laughs> miss the kill cam. Because when you spawn <laughs> and you're dead three seconds later, and you ultimately you really don't know where it came from. Could it yeah. come from anywhere? Yeah. And then you spawn again and die again, and mm -hmm. once again you don't know where it's coming from. It can be really frustrating. Right. Well, and, and once people have, you know, gotten a few ranks and they've unlocked some of the special weapons and they start calling in airstrikes right. on their base, there's not a whole lot that you can do. You know, we can't talk about this beta without talking about the, you know, pay for weaponry uh, add-on stuff. Right. I mean, if you yeah. want these add-on weapons, you're going to have to pay real money right. for it. Which, now, there are some add-on weapons that you'll be able to get if from pre-ordering at different right. retailers, big box mm. retailers, and they've said that those guns will be unlocked for free later on mm. into the life of the game. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, 
I hope this isn't the beginning of a trend. Right. Uh, I mean, this this is that's really a case of microtransactions just taken too fucking far. Right. The, it, when you're when you're actually hampering gameplay experiences, because imagine going into an online match, and you you told me earlier that you you've been reading that this is going to be a very single player focused battlefield game, right. unlike the others. So, but there's still the multiplayer element, yeah. and I can imagine being in a multiplayer setting where somebody else has bought these weapons and they have this advantage. That's not going to make me not. That's not going to make me want to go out and buy the weapons. It's going to make me not want to play the fucking game. Yeah, I mean, when you're spending sixty dollars for a game, really, you really want to nickel and dime people for like two right. or three dollars for extra guns. Right. And they've said that the guns won't offer a competitive advantage. And if they don't offer a competitive advantage, then why would people want to pay for them? Exactly. So I. I, I I, th I think that's PR. I actually really like the destructible buildings. You know, yeah. it's, re it's really cool being in some place and a wall explodes. And I've you know, we've seen games that do the destructible environments before. Usually, it's very much pre-scripted. I know they offer a lot of freedom in this game. One of the matches in the uh, like Evergreen Forest, mm -hmm. and uh, the guy was running through, and someone shot a rocket launcher at the tree, and it broke off and hit the guy running underneath it in the head, <laughs> no and he kidding. died. Uh, I don't know if it was from the tree falling on his head or just concussion from the rocket launcher, but I have to say, like watching that, it kind of blew me away. I hope it was from the tree because that's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what I'm choosing to believe. Right. Uh, but I mean. And this game really gets the whole like, chaos. Like, there's no place to hide on this battlefield. Oh, yeah. you, you duck behind a wall and a tank shoots at it. That wall's gone and you right. have nowhere else to hide. Right. I think it, uh, you can also, once you do get used to it, you're gonna be able to really use it to your advantage. Like there yeah. was one point where I was actually in a backyard and I'm like, how the hell do I get out of this place? And I couldn't find a way out. And I was like, oh, I have a rocket launcher. Oh, I can just shoot that fence. <laughs> yeah. sh boom, made my own path. I was playing a game of peekaboo with, uh, with one of the tanks. I had the rocket launcher, and I ducked out from behind a wall, shot him, mm -hmm. went behind a sand dune. He couldn't get to me. Jumped up over the sand dune really quick, just enough to get my cursor on him. <laughs> shot again, plus oh, nice. ten, boom, dead. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So. Well, those are those are definitely like those are pure battlefield moments right. that are definitely still in this game. I think it's actually harder to get those moments now because you can't hide. Right. Because of the the spotting, the on-screen blip. Um, pops up when you fire your the, gun. The pops up, yeah. You fire your gun at somebody, and when you fire your gun at somebody, I don't know if you actually have to hit them or if you just have to fire at them. It was sort of like the way that they used to do the spot in the old battlefield where it was actually a separate command, which right. would say, like, tank here or soldier here, but it seems this time, if you just point your gun at somebody and you pull the trigger, then it does the spot automatically. Right, yeah. I mean, it kind of reminds me of uh, Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter when you could put up, oh, you right. could put up the little UAVs, and yeah. if the UAV spotted them, they would appear in 3D real space. Mm -hmm. But that UAV UAV had to be in the air and had to be able to see them. Mm -hmm. This time it seems like it just it's magically automatic. pops up yeah. if they fire their gun, they right. pop up. Well regardless, I don't like it. Yeah. I don't like the blip, I don't like not being able to hide from anybody. That removes a whole level of FPS skill sets. You get used to going around corners, you know, obfuscating people's vision and using that to your advantage and this kind of just wipes that all away. Yeah. The core like gameplay feels good. Uh, the destructibility feels good. Mm -hmm. I think the sound design is really good. Definitely. Uh, the thing that like confused me though is this little like every now like and then the this, this squeak would pop up like yeah. a and I'm like, what the fuck is that? Medic! Well, I, I've talked to a couple buddies and like we've come up with it's a theory we believe like most modern you know military personnel they have a headset but speaker and microphone mm -hmm. and we think when anytime you go near an explosion it causes an overload of the speaker and that's what it's the reverb from the speaker that's coming oh, really? through and causing that squawk i think it probably it possibly might add a lot to the game say if you had a team that was coordinating verbally and talking to one another and mm -hmm. it would be interesting to see if it overloaded if you were unable disrupt to disrupt their communication yeah i yeah. mean that would be kind of interesting it would just add you know a whole other element of just <laughs> this shock of war
it does feel a lot like the last Battlefield game. On right, Xbox, and your so. skill sets will transfer. They if will transfer. If you're a hardcore Battlefield player. Right. The but the one skill set that I think doesn't transfer is like dropping to your knee, taking a sec, and going pop, pop, pop. Like yeah. that first shot was almost always 100% accurate if you just took your time to aim a little bit. And this one, this game definitely feels more prey and spray. Yeah, in this game, you kind of just aim at the other guy and hope that one of the bullets kills him. Mm -hmm. The destructibility, I am enjoying it in multiplayer, but I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on single player and see how that plays out. Mines. Bomb. Missile. For a PSN game, this was kind of thought of, oh, not a real wipeout. Well, it is a real wipeout now. And I, I, think, they, I think they amped it yeah, up. I think, it, I think it's it looks, bigger than what it was originally planned to I think be. it looks pretty phenomenal. I love the PSP games, too. I thought they were great. And this is almost like a greatest hits version of the, P, the PSP games. If you hadn't, for whatever reason, if you didn't have a PSP and you didn't play the, these two games that just came out, this is going to be monumental. Right. Well, the you, tracks you know? and the music, you know, yeah. they are kind of repurposed from those games. But you're right, those games were great. A lot of people didn't play them. Whenever anyone walks up when I'm playing it, they're just like, wow, this is yeah, really It's a really phenomenal cool. sense of speed. It's very oh, yeah. smooth. Yeah, it's, it's really what you want. It feels familiar. The weapons, almost all the good weapons are back. It just seems balanced because you know, some of the past wipeouts, the, the weapons were too strong. Right. I mean, we only have four tracks so far, and, and like you said, this is this beta version or whatever it is we're playing is is uh, is kind of buggy. It's a little buggy. It's a little buggy, but I mean, I don't know. I think the biggest gameplay change is the most. The thing we've talked about. It's the most important. The control. The motion motion control is just incredible in this game. I mean, we're both old school wipeout guys, and it, it's the first real sensation that's changed the series in a good way to me since like Wipeout XL and Three, which are the last ones I really love. Yeah. Final lap. All the other PS3 racing games, I start out with motion control and eventually I succumb to analog or digital. And this is one where I feel it really fundamentally changes the experience to the level where I really want to learn. I know you have already learned. Yeah, well, I ha well I I'm learning it, right? I played Wipeout on D-pads for, you know, whatever, over 10 years now, right? And I'm good at it. It's not just steering, it's also the pitch, yeah. and it's crucial. You just turn it like this to turn left and right, and up and down to control the pitch, and they, if you're using a dual shock, which you kind of you you have I mean, like, to, I this think. This game really works well with dual shock. Yeah, like it, when it, what it does is it rumbles when you're off pitch, when you're not like on the same pitch that you should be compared to the track. And like you said, you can worry about pitch on the on the D-pad, it's just up and down on the D-pad, but a lot of people, I think, just disregard that. If you come up a board, some really, really sharp turn, you can kind of pull back a little bit, slow you slow yourself down because your pitch is totally wrong for that part of the track, and, you know, make a nice kind of smooth curve. Well, and that first time, you're gonna be hitting walls, you're gonna be frustrated, you're yeah. gonna to wanna to give it up. It's basically like the first time I used a force feedback wheel. I was always overcompensating, so I'd be snaking left and right down the track, when in actuality, what you really wanna do is just go straight. Right. Uh, I've yeah. been playing for a whole week now, and I'm getting pretty good, but still, when I play on Phantom Class, the fastest class, I'm hitting walls. I'm not, I'm not perfect yet. definitely better with motion control than I am. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that when this game comes out, the guys who master that, will they be able to own the online players who are playing with digital? Do you, do you think it's going to be a, you know, like a real divide? I think it's going to look nicer when they play. If you know your line perfectly, it just looks pristine as you're sliding through it. I've been playing entirely with motion control, and so I decided that I'd try the D-pad again, um, you know, right. just to see what it was like. And uh, since I had been playing for like four or five days with motion control, it felt very static. Like I felt like I was going to a uh, an active experience to a passive experience. Yeah. And for me to say that Wipeout feels like a passive experience is just strange to me. When I was playing with my 5.1 headphones on and doing the motion control, like, I've never felt You're like immersed. I was in it. Yeah, I was as, as immersed as I've ever been in a Wipeout game before. I wish they kind of stuck it more in the forefront. Like, 
said, this is a new wipeout, this is the thing that's new in this game, but motion control defaults to off. You have to, the first setting you can switch to on is like pitch or pitch only, and one more setting over is pitch and steering. I mean, it's really, you have to want to learn motion control. You know, it does take a long time. When you learn how to do this, it feels really good, and it felt like what I felt like after I learned to uh, fly a helicopter in Battlefield Desert Combat, which came out years ago, was just something that, you know, you'd have to spend a weekend right. learning how to play, and then once you know it, you 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 love it. But it's I just think, fun. I think after five races, you'll see you know appreciable increase in your skills. Oh, stick yeah. with it. Don't give it up. Because right. I you know I'm, I thought about giving up, and I'm going to stick with it myself. Yeah. Final lap. Custom soundtracks, which is like so important to this game and it really does a good job with them. Like yeah. you actually get to see things changing and the audio changes. Yeah, zone mode is incredible. You know, it's been in since Wipeout Pure, but uh, in Pulse they just repurposed the in-game tracks with this kind of new effect on the top of them and that's what they've done here. But the effect is amazing. When this like wave of energy comes and changes the whole track and yeah. colors, and so you see these like visual representations of the audio waveforms of the music like right. pulsating on the tracks, and when you play your own songs, it really puts you in it. it. Almost makes it feel like a rhythm game in right. a way. The actual soundtrack in the game, even though it's mostly songs from Pulse. Because they're mixed in 5.1 now, if you happen to be playing on a 5.1 system, it's like just incredible. I mean, the game just sounds way better than it's ever sounded. Zone 10, clear. You know, I've never used it in the PSP version, but I like the photo mode in this one too. The fact that you can kind of frame up your own. Well, it's you, really you rudimentary, can, but it's well, like. Well, you can even add like motion blur effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you took some pretty cool looking screens. That's, I mean, that's just it. It's like, it, when you're using it, you're like, oh, this could be so much better. But then you look at the screenshots you can actually make with it. It's pretty impressive. Well, yeah, and really you, cool. can, you can set them as your wallpaper. You can send that's them to a friend, share them at home. Yeah, it's, it's very forward thinking. Our biggest complaint with this game is kind of, it seems like a minor nitpick, but. It's the crappy HUD. In Wipeout, it's so fast, you have to right. be able to quickly look, with just a fraction of a second, up at places on your HUD to know information, and you can't do that with and it's It's ugly, because the menus look really good. The menus are like a Wipeout 3 minimalist, stylish thing, yeah, the totally, wireframes, and totally. then like you get to the HUD, and it's just tacky and in your face and I don't like it. It seems like something they could still fix. I mean, they oh, have yeah. some time, maybe some options for what the HUD looks like, so. Just make it look more like the menus. I yeah. mean, the menus have like clean Helvetica text, like, you know, crisp, simple lines. Like, right. that's what I want the HUD to look like. You know, and they still haven't announced pricing on this and we've been wondering, well, how much would you pay? And I would, if it How much would you pay? Well, you know, assuming it has 8 to 12 tracks, that's kind of, we're kind of assuming. Yeah, that's what we want. Yeah, plus downloadable right, content. 8 to 12 tracks, plus downloadable content, 8 player online, custom soundtracks. I would easily pay 29. Oh, yeah. And I would begrudgingly pay 39. And if it's something like 20, it's a steal. I would be fine paying as much as I'd pay for a PSP game, at least. Yeah. So I'd pay 40, and that would be fine. And I, I hope they go for 29.99. I think that would be an outstanding but price. Yeah, price. It's, it's for me the most exciting PSN release yet. I mean, Warhawk was great. I, like, there's a bit of good stuff, but this for me is what PSN is all about. I can't, I, can't wait to play on. I can't wait until I don't have to play my four-track buggy demo anymore, and I can like play the real Final Finish version. I'm just really excited. <sighs> my God, it's lovely, beautiful. Star Galactica, the final season. All new every Friday at 10 on Sci-Fi. I was talking to Josh Muscarin, some of the other people that work at Relic, the company here's team, 
like last year, like let's get around to a game. And it was always like, yeah, as soon as we can, or like, oh, there's another patch coming, let's do it after then. And then you like saw someone at the show and ran up to him at GDC and harassed him. Like some kind of crazy fanboy. Yeah, like, did. we want to play you. He's like, all right. <laughs> and then he made it happen. Before we even started, though, I thought we were going to lose because they had the balance team guy on. I was like, okay, he's going to have coached them and they're going to have a plan and we're going to be screwed. With Plus, team they're all sitting in a room together, not even on vent. Like, they were literally there together. I don't know, just all these things stacked up against us and the fact that a new patch had just come out. But, I mean, we poop socked the game pretty much, though, so it was like we had every one of those days to, to learn it. We talk about how we play sometimes in the podcast, and we were talking about, you know, we call it the bang bus, where we, we, you know, you can see it in the replay, where we take our HQs and move them up to the front lines immediately. So I heard that now internally everyone refers to it also as the bang bus, but so when the first match started, three of the people on their team all came straight for me. They knew the bang bus was there. They started putting up like mines on the road to, to stop any other ones that would come forward. Man, it could have just been, that's how it happened. But I was like thinking, like they decided. They, they knew we gotta, that like, Sean should die. Yeah, let's, let's take him out so he can't talk a word of shit. I thought it was over. You guys, I would hear you talking about, there's an MG over here or something. And I'd be like, uh, don't worry about that MG, man. There's like, there's a, like 20 squads in my base. Yeah. Even if it got me out that early, I wouldn't have been out, out. I could have like got another truck and just moved into your guys' right, bases. That, I think that would have been it though. You know what happens to morale when, when you're playing and one person on your team is losing and everyone else is doing fine. Just like, I'm out guys, I'm out. And then it's just like drags everyone down. So they could have like, they were probably shooting for that, but they didn't take out my casualty clearing center. So every time they killed my guys, the meds would just come out and pick them back they up. destroyed a German top. Italian HQ is confirmed. It can start securing resources from the air. The second game, we usually play allies, and then this time we were playing Axis. On a map that they said was clearly ally favored. That, that's which is why we talked him into playing it. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that, but I don't think it is. It sounds like we're setting it up to say that we lost this time, and we almost did. You know, I mean, they, all they signs had... point to us losing the whole game, like until like 45 minutes in. You were like, the I was defeatist, in my base man. the whole time in vent. I was basically like, and not necessarily in vent because I didn't want to bring you down. But when Garnet came over and looked over my shoulder, he was like, "You're done." I'm like, "I know, dude. I don't even know why I'm still playing." Yeah, I've had to yell at you before, like, "Dude, pack your fucking stuff up, move it into our base." <laughs> and start again. <laughs> like, Rory and I were like on the right side of the map. You and Matt were on the left, so we said, all right, forget about them. Let's just assume worst case scenario, they're gonna be wiped out and we're gonna be facing like four against two, but just keep going. And four and four is a big game, so there's so many things happening. And right when we did this big counteroffensive and like really knocked, started knocking one of their teammates out, you guys had at that point amassed like a whole bunch of tanks and armor. You had ammo for artillery strikes and stuff. And then you had like a fair battle on your side. But as soon as you took out like the first couple guys' bases, they just wanted to call it. I mean, it was pretty much over at that point, but. I mean, who, who could have seen that coming? Seriously. This is the thing with when you watch replays, there's always like, oh, if I would have done this, or if I would have done that, and then and so it's like anyone can critique in, in hindsight, you know, if they did the same thing as us, let's just ignore the guys that are gonna come like hit us on this side and throw everything we got, and then it would have just been this lopsided. Right, they throw all everything at me early on. on. The whole time we were wondering if we were going to win. I mean, it, it wasn't we're like get our ass beat. Yeah, there was never any like serious route where like this isn't fun because it's clear that it's lopsided. You know, one team's like 
better than another. So it was fun the entire time, and well, I think they had fun too. They want to. Put, they were talking about playing us again. Well, not just not playing us though. That dude Aldrich that I contacted from Relic said that he's gonna he's gonna put together an even better team. So it's not even gonna be the same people next time. It'll probably be like four balance testers versus us, God. and they'll watch our replays yeah. or something. I got the emails too, and it was like rematch, rematch, rematch. It's <laughs> like, man, can't you just let us like feel like feel some glory for a while? Yeah, enjoy our victory for a little bit before you threaten us with like your A team, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah.